when I got help, it wasn't actually to help myself. It was because I was worried that I wasn't looking after my patients well enough and I wasn't doing the best job for them. And it was that point I was crying at work every day and just not functioning. And I thought, this is not professional. This is not safe. And so I've got to do this for my patients. Hello and welcome to the Straight Talking Doctor podcast. My name is Dr. Mark Cox and this is the podcast dedicated to improving your health and happiness. My aim is to demystify the complex world of wellness and mental health through eye-opening conversations with guests from any and every walk of life. No topic is out of bounds, no question too big or too small. As well as discussing my guest inspiring stories, I want my conversations to fuel you all with useful and actionable tips that you can adopt into your daily lives. In this first series, we shall be taking a journey into mental health, tackling topics such as dealing with trauma and depression, overcoming addiction, and beating cancer not once, but twice. So thank you for joining me on this journey. Please sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the ride. Welcome guys. Today is a very special episode as I've got not one but two medical professionals sitting down with me to put the world to right. So welcome guys. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Taj, let's start with you. Um, You have been extremely open and honest on your socials about some of the struggles that you've had. So first, maybe let's go into what stage of training are you at in terms of your uh, medicine training and, and a little bit into what your mental health journey has been like. So I'm in my fourth year at King studying medicine. Um, I first became unwell with my mental health prior to going to university. So it was around the time of my GCSEs when I was thinking of applying to medical school. And obviously, as you both know, like getting into medical school is quite competitive. It can be quite challenging. Um, you're kind of expected to not only be good at at academics and have the top grades, but to be good at co-curricular things, sports, music, and to kind of be this all-rounder, like, excellent human. (laughs) And I put a lot of pressure on myself um, to get into medical school, kind of made it like a life or death situation in my head. Um, And I was just very stressed, basically, so much so that I kind of I started controlling what I was eating and how much exercise I was doing, I guess, subconsciously as a form of control at a time in my life where I felt very out of control. Um, Thankfully, I managed to recover from, so I was sort of diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. Well, I was, not sort of, I was. Um, But at the time, the waiting list for CAM, so Child and Adolescent Mental Health, for those listening who don't know what CAM stands for, um the list the waiting list was so so high as unfortunately it normally is so thankfully with the help of loved ones and my GP I was able to get a lot better and then during my third year at medical school um I started to feel very down I started to feel very low I started to feel very anxious I started sort of withdrawing myself from social scenarios um, started overthinking everything getting really 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 anxious so was diagnosed with depression and generalized anxiety disorder Um, and because of my previous experience with mental health I sort of thought oh I can do this on my own I can get better I've got better before on my own I say on my own but I still was having lots of support from loved ones and my GP but I kind of thought oh I don't need professional help for this I can just I can be happy again so I definitely delayed seeking help from my GP for a very long time for that reason because of the stigma because of the stigma in the medical profession especially I thought oh gosh I can't be a medical student and a future doctor with a mental health illness that doesn't happen spoiler alert it does <laughs> um a lot so yeah eventually I went to my GP because of the strain and the stress I was putting on loved ones and just myself really I realized that I didn't need to be this unwell forever um so yeah I got help from my GP I um did some cognitive behavioral therapy I started an antidepressant and then I guess fast forward two years so I'm in my fourth year of medicine but I did a interpolated degree during my third and fourth year so this is actually my fifth year at uni so fast forward two and a bit years and I'm now the healthiest and happiest I've ever been um because of 
yeah reaching out for help basically <laughs> I'm really happy to hear you're in that place Tash um I can tell just from how you're speaking about your experiences that that is that is completely true and you look very full of life um and there's a lot to unpick from just what you said there and I think we can delve straight back into that in a minute but I'm going to give Steph a chance to firstly how's GP training going and did you hear any similarities with Tash about what she's been through and if so, what were they and where where does your story differ? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, I'm Steph. I'm a GPSD3, so third year of GP training at the moment. Tash and I know each other, so it's lovely doing this podcast together and um, nice to hear um, your story, Tash. Definitely some similarities, um, which we've kind of talked about before. I think the main ones that sticked out for me were um, the worry about the stigma. So I have anxiety and depression and was diagnosed uh, two years ago. But I really, when I reflect back on things, I've had struggled with anxiety since I was probably in primary school. Um, And as I got older, I ignored and ignored it and ignored it. And also the thing that Tash said as well about um, feeling like you can do it yourself. So it was always like, oh, I don't need any help. Uh, You know, I can do this myself. I can fix myself. And I didn't want that label. I didn't want the stigma. I didn't want to be discriminated against. All these things I was worried about for so long. The other thing that I recognized from Tasha's story was the bit where she said that when she finally got help, she did it. um, She did it because of the strain that she was putting on other people. And it's really interesting in a similar way. When I got help, it wasn't actually to help myself. It was because I was worried that I wasn't looking after my patients well enough and I wasn't doing the best job for them. And it was that point I was crying at work every day and just not functioning. And I thought, this is not professional. This is not safe. And so I've got to do this for my patients. And then only as time went on, and similar, very similar to Tash, um, I've had CBT, thought it was amazing. Um, I've had, um, I'm currently on Sertraline as well, which has helped me so much. Um, but also, I'm now in a place where I'm doing it for myself, which is great. But it's so interesting what we both said, you know, initially when we got help, we weren't doing it for ourselves because we weren't putting ourselves first. Thank you so much for opening up, Steph. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, really sort of important points that you both mentioned on there. Tash, you, you, you mentioned something about being in medicine and maybe not being likely to seek help. Do you think people in the healthcare profession are less likely to seek help? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I did my psychiatry, my first psychiatry placement in in my third year when I started to become unwell. And I even noticed the stigma amongst medical students like, oh, most patients, patients in psychiatry don't get better, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to share my journey on social media is I, I definitely believe it's possible to get better. I mean, it is. Um, even people with chronic mental health conditions such as you know, like borderline personality disorder, people can definitely live with these conditions and live really happy and normal lives with the right support. So that was the first thing. And then I think, I mean, obviously you both are doctors, I'm not yet, but I definitely see this kind of rhetoric that, oh, you're a doctor, you know all about these diseases, you should be able to kind of prevent and treat them yourselves which I don't know whether we would say the same thing about a physical health condition um but it's sort of like oh you should know all about these diseases and have the tools and be able to prevent them I don't know whether you agree with that um but that's how I kind of felt and then I guess there's sort of the stigma that patients will see you differently um if you know they will see you as weak um if you have a mental health illness and if you yourself need support from a doctor which is fairly sort of critical I think and and not really fair just because doctors are there to treat and support patients doesn't mean that they can't be a patient themselves. Yeah absolutely Um, completely agree with that and I think doctors are definitely um, culprits in not seeking medical attention I think physically I think they tend to do that as well I think they take on a lot of the burden um, but actually it's quite clear that mentally people are not seeking the support that they need. I I guess I want to move on a little bit now to uh, how much do you think medicine played a role, if any, in your mental health issues? Yeah, cool. So it's an interesting one. So I I would say... My, I would say I've always tried to hide my anxiety um, and always tried to hide any low mood that I've had. Um, Medical school, I think, 
Probably the worst bits for me were the exam times. Um, there was quite an unhealthy competition at my medical school. Um, you're put into deciles and that gives you points that allow you to then get into uh, places for your foundation training. And so there was this almost feeling like you're against other people rather than what I think would be great. And what I hope is happening more now is that all working together, because at the end of the day, we all want to be great doctors, right? We all want to provide great patient care to everyone. Um, so that definitely um, worsened my stress. And then in my foundation, foundation year two job um I unfortunately just had a run of jobs that just didn't encourage lunch breaks um a lot of people were very stressed in it there was lots of jobs with very poor patient outcomes and I unfortunately had a supervisor um in that year in my foundation second year of foundation training who when I was crying in a meeting and just explaining how stressed I was um suggested that I was too empathetic to be a doctor and maybe I'd consider a different career and that had a massive impact me on me and kind of contributed towards me not being so sure if medicine was the right thing for me um you know finding it so stressful but also being told that but then just on a good note um I also uh, did a psych placement as part of my GP training or rotation as part of my GP training and it was great to see the focus from that team um and I think you know what is so evident is that there's just so many variables so going from where I'd been in a different job where mental health was just it was not encouraged to look after your mental health and in fact it was discouraged because they were short-staffed and we needed to put the patients first um to a place where self-care was massive and I was supported so much I became unwell in that job I was supported um I was you know in, told that my health is more important than my job which was major and um, that's the first time anyone had ever told me that and I was supported in returning to work. And um, so in that way, medicine played a really good part. But I think it's a real shame that the stigma still massively exists. And I'm sure, Tash, um, you, you've seen that as well in med school. Just like, I, I think there's loads more to be done. But hopefully, we're on a upward trajectory or things are going to get better. I'm really glad to hear that you did actually get the support in one of the jobs. Um but I don't know about you, Tash, but for me, that seems like that's a, a rarity for, for some of the medical profession. Um, and I guess we could extend that to other professions as well, but particularly for doctors, I don't know if we always feel supported, but it's fantastic that you got the support. In terms of medicine causing mental health issues, I think it definitely does compared to other careers. The stats that we hear are massive. Um, there was a recent survey where 85% of people um, surveyed who were doctors reported having mental health issues, about 50% with anxiety and 32% uh, admitting to having depression at some part of their career, which I just think is staggering. On that note, have you seen these experiences that you, that you guys have been through echoed by your fellow colleagues or students? Yes. Definitely. <laughs> um, I think especially, you know, anxiety disorders and, and depression are so, so common. Um, and I think by talking about it and just sharing experiences, I think it does encourage other people to seek help. Um, I found that when I was struggling, I didn't really know any other medical students or know of any other medical students who who had suffered from a mental illness you you read the stats but I think it's hard to kind of embrace those stats without sort of putting faces to the stats or putting people to the stats they're just numbers and you're just like oh but then once you start sort of sitting in a room like I do it so often now when I'm in a in a tutorial or whatever with with 15 people and I'm sort of going around the room and going oh one in four of you or maybe more have or have had a mental health condition and it feels a bit more feels a bit nicer <laughs> um sort of feeling like you're not alone sorry I went off on a bit of a tangent there but yeah I, I definitely think that I, I now know having spoken openly about my own mental health I now know so many other medical students who have but so many other medical students have opened up to me, um, even ones that don't share their experience on social media, for example, like we do. Um, just people that have privately messaged me um, saying, oh, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I've been through X, Y and Z, which is really nice that people feel comfortable to do that. I think you alluded to it in one of your earlier answers, Tash, but I guess when you're discussing the, the fact that the stats don't really match up, um, do you think that maybe it's because of the pressure that we are hiding it as medical professionals? Do people try and not come out and say things as the pressure is there not to face that? 
Yeah, I definitely think so. I think one of the biggest fear I've seen amongst medical students is this fear of the GMC, the General Medical Council, Council and um, this thing called fitness to practice, whether you're fit to be a doctor. And I think this starts before you even get to medical school, when you have your application. And I think it sort of stems over the wording. I think quite often the question is, do you have any health conditions to declare and that word declare to me is horrible it makes me think of being in an airport and declaring drugs or (laughs) like being arrested or I always get really freaked out even though I've never done anything like that (laughs) hello anxiety um but but yeah I think this word declare makes it seem like you've done something wrong and it's like I just don't think that's the best choice of word it's a silly simple silly thing and then but I think this yeah, fear of if you admit that you have a mental health condition, occupational health, everybody's going to step in and be like, no, you can't be a doctor, Um, which is completely misinterpreted and misunderstood because I think I've read so many times what the GMC actually says about mental health conditions. And and obviously you have to be um, safe around your patients, but the number of times I think the GMC would get involved for someone's mental health is so 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 slim and even if they did it would be temporarily they wouldn't stop you from ever practicing as a doctor I don't think um so I think that's that's the first thing why people hide it um and I think there's this pressure to sort of rush through medical school you know don't take any time off it's already five or six years long there's this rush to become a doctor and to start you know the training pathway can be can be so long depending on what specialty you want to do that there can be this pressure to just keep going keep getting your head stuck in a book and just yeah kind of don't take a breath just keep keep swimming (laughs) um so yeah that's kind of what I what I feel about that yeah I mean 100% the first thing I ever say to medical students these days when I see them on the ward is is just you know what when we're on the conversation of what's their plan is are you taking a year out you know are are you going to take some time for yourself have you really thought things through um and I'm approaching, I'm into my F4 and we'll definitely be doing an F5, which for anyone not in, in healthcare, um, that means I'm not in training, doing doing a role in a hospital, but not getting any closer to being um, a GP or consultant. It has its, has its pros, definitely. That's why I do it. But, you know, there can be an internal pressure to jump back on that, that wagon to jump back on the train and, and, and get cracking. But, but actually taking some time out and, and finding yourself a little bit is so important. Steph, we said that mental health issues are higher in doctors and, and Tash has alluded to a couple of reasons why there. Is there anything else you think that you found since practicing causes us to have more mental health issues? I mean, probably the one that gets maybe talked about the most um and is is the responsibility and the fact that we're dealing with stressful situations all the time um and we've got this responsibility to kind of look after others um and unfortunately we can never get rid of human error that is something that's always going to exist and this worry about are we doing the right thing for our patients and you know when there's added pressures like being short of staff or um just not having enough time in the day or um, people getting super unwell. It just builds and builds and builds and builds. Um, I think it's, it's, I think unfortunately the culture in the NHS at the moment is not one of speaking up and speaking out and sharing. And um, as we've just spoken about, as Tash just mentioned as well, the feeling of loneliness and feeling alone is probably one of the most horrible things. And I'm sure we've all experienced that to an extent with the pandemic, but I think the word lonely when I've been at my absolute worst and absolute lowest um lowest times and times when I've not wanted to be here anymore the feeling of loneliness and being alone has been my main feeling it's been no one else will understand me no one else was going to get what I'm going through I can't do this anymore Uh, you know no one you know it's just this horrible horrible feeling and I think it was really interesting what Tash said as well about um the GMC because it's that thing isn't it of the fear of declaring something and the fear of saying something for fear of um, being discriminated against or treated differently actually it's just encouraging more and more people not to look after themselves because is, you know they're saying okay you've got to keep going got to keep going got to keep going and everyone ends up burning out I think that's just a human that's a human thing if we're not looking after ourselves that's where we're going to get um and really what we want is for everyone to feel able to look after themselves and able to take a lunch break and you know physically and mentally 
feel stable enough because they're in a work environment where people are encouraging them to do so. And then, you know, we can all work better and, and things will hopefully improve. Yeah, and being able to speak up when they've made a mistake. I was just going to add one thing, and I think Steph and I have actually spoken about this before. I think it's interesting. I think one of the things I've always thought about is do medical students and medical professionals suffer from mental health illnesses um, more because of their personality or because of the job and I think after speaking to a few people I think it's a combination of both I think like I said at the start kind of medical professionals even to get into university it's so competitive so you have to kind of be good at everything and I think that perfectionism kind of starts from pretty early on and I think we're all inherently really hard on ourselves like Steph said earlier you've got to do really well for your exams so you're putting pressure on internal pressure on yourself to do to do well there you you know you want to be the best doctor you want to there's a lot of pressure to do things outside of just medicine you know publish articles and um do research and to present posters at conferences to do phds if you want to do surgery and all of this these extra things that um i think a lot of medics have definitely traits of perfectionism which yeah when things go wrong they're very hard on themselves and it's no doubt that they struggle with with low mood and low self-esteem i think you're completely right i totally agree um it's the pressure of perfectionism in a role and a profession that doesn't always allow for being perfect. Like what Steph said as well, there are, you, can't, you can't account for human error. It happens. But the difference is in medicine, that error can be the difference between at the end, extreme scale, and very rarely is life and death. But that's something, as particularly as a young doctor, you, you sort of associate with making a mistake. And that's what makes it hard to speak out. And to tell a more personal story, I remember when I first made an error, luckily I haven't been involved in many significant errors. Whoop, whoop. Um, But when I did first make an error, I prescribed penicillin, uh, a penicillin drug. There's there's many different varieties for anyone that's not medical um, to a patient who was penicillin allergic because I was on a psychiatry placement Mm. that was not on electronic prescribing. So the allergies wouldn't, you know, usually if you do that on a computer, it blocks it straight away. A big red message comes out and you go, oh, that's good because I hadn't checked that. And it comes up. It's happened before. But if you do on paper, Mm. it requires a pharmacist to check it if you you don't check it. Um, And they received the drug and luckily they were okay. They had no reaction. It was an old allergy that wasn't a real allergy, which happens quite a lot. And they were absolutely fine. But I remember feeling like that was the end of the world. Uh, it was very scary. Yeah. And I didn't even want to tell anyone about it. And look at me now, I'm talking on a podcast anyone can listen to. I made that mistake and I, just, <laughs> I went and found yeah. the patient the next day and I apologised. And they were actually absolutely fine with it. I held my hands up. And I have made a couple of mistakes since. Um, similar sort of things or, or not as bad. Um, and luckily nothing has come of them. But I remember my response to them internally was very different. I still did the same things in terms of apologizing. um, But I wasn't quite as upset with myself because these human errors do happen. But when you are in that mode, when it's the biggest thing in the world, it's such a stress on your mental health. When you first become a doctor, that can be the, the difference between really tipping you over the edge. You're just about holding on. You're doing these long shifts. And then suddenly bang, you make a mistake and, and, and the world, your world can turn upside down. I've seen it happen. Yeah. The mistakes are so scary. I, I, I definitely agree with that. The fear of the fear of you doing something. I think, I think probably the strongest emotion I can feel is when I have made mistakes, um, and I can't think of like a specific one, but it happens to everyone. Everyone makes mistakes. Um, thinking back to how I made the mistake and thinking, Oh, I wasn't, I was just doing, I wasn't really constant. I didn't concentrate to make them, you know, I was just doing about 20 things because you know trying to get through my list of things and then oh my gosh I just didn't even really have a moment to concentrate on that and think on that and then it's this awful guilt and shame and everything else that goes around it and rather than you know I I think we're we're trying more and more aren't we um as a community to kind of you know learn not blame and and um have these moments but we don't really have check-ins to 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 say you you know if you have a good supervisor or a good senior they might check if you're okay and they might do that but there's not much structure in terms of you know 
it's okay to make a mistake. It's better that you tell me about, you know, being open. Even, you know, our, our, our aim of the game is to look after the patients, right? Um, hopefully look after ourselves first, but to look after the patients. And the, pa- the best way that the patient can be safe is if we feel able to speak out about stuff and not hide stuff. Because if someone doesn't feel able to admit that they've done something, at the end of the day, that's only going to affect the patient in a worse way, not a better way. Yeah. Turning a mistake into a learning event, isn't it? And it's that sort of mindset switch. Just want to go back um, to when you guys were struggling with your mental health and being in the world of medicine. How was it coming out and speaking about it? Did you feel supported? Um, Was it an easy process? Um, I was overwhelmed by the support. I was overwhelmed with how many people were interested in hearing what I had to say with hearing about my story and you know could relate to it um I was overwhelmed and and shocked both in good ways at times and shocked kind of a little bit upsettingly with how many people could relate um but I I started sharing my experience during the first lockdown which I guess well was a really I don't guess it was a really difficult time for a lot of people um so just being able to talk openly about it I guess I find it weird admitting that I me talking on social media has helped somebody I still find that really weird (laughs) to admit um but I guess my whole point of it was I mean it wasn't all self selfishness selfish it wasn't me just giving, like, I gained a lot from speaking about it. It was almost like journaling for some people. Um, it was getting my thoughts out to the out on paper, out to the world. So that was one of the reasons why I did it. The other reason was what I've spoken about before. But the fact that I was helping myself whilst also helping one or two people along the way was just a, an amazing thing. Prior to this, you know, I'd always heard negative things about social media and don't get me wrong there are there are negative things about it but just to be able to use it and I guess find this community of people and similar people sharing about their mental health has been so great for me I think it's one thing to hear you know someone in a different country in a different profession just a completely different life talking about it and it's another thing being able to relate to somebody I think that makes you feel less that's isolated as well if that makes sense Steph do you want to answer the same question or yeah no um, I I definitely um, echo a lot of what Tash said I think for me um, when I first uh, admitted because I wasn't functioning at work anymore that I had an issue um, and when I got that diagnosis of anxiety and depression I felt so disappointed in myself so ashamed so weak it took me a really really long time to be okay with it whereas now I'm like hey guys I have anxiety and depression how are you doing how's it going like this is so common let's be honest my vis- my view on things is that everything's on a spectrum I really don't think there is one mental you know you have a mental health problem where you don't have a mental health problem everyone gets stressed if you don't I'm very jealous of you but also I hope you're not hiding things and I hope you're okay I mean I think the in terms of um I mean it's true right because I mean people hide stuff because they have all this shame that we've spoken about and I, I worry sometimes that that I try not to worry all the time, but I worry sometimes that that's what it could be um with the social media you know similar to hash it was it was so heartwarming. I remember I shared my story on, I think it's an account called Humans of COVID. Um, and I shared a story of, um, I had really severe anxiety in the first wave of COVID. And the messages I got from people just saying things like, I really thought I was the only one. I've never heard anyone from the medical profession speak out about it. And obviously I'm not the first one, but that was so lovely. You know, you really feel like you've, you've helped someone and to be able to do that. And as I said, it's, it's not, loads and loads of people but anyone you can help and 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 help them feel less alone was just so lovely um so yeah I I really enjoy I mean I've been so lazy on my Instagram recently but I really enjoy trying to put stuff out there and um you know just being real as possible um and again it's like connection as Tasha said as well when you can see other people um for me it was a massive weight off my shoulders I was suddenly like this is me I have anxiety and depression I'm not gonna hide it anymore I'm not here to kind of go on about it, but it's a part of me and it's not going to go away. Life's going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, it's just, it seems like an amplification of that 
feeling you must get when you speak out because you just like showing the world which must be so liberating but also that acting as a a soundboard Mm. for people who are going through similar things is is really quite a special thing and if anyone doesn't follow tash binney or stephanie slater on instagram i would head on over there they like you said the word real there is the word (laughs) real is very true and you're very very honest so definitely anyone that is that is interested in medicine or mental health or anything like that then please do go and drop the girls a follow Thank you. I was just going to add one more thing as well to like Steph was saying about, <laughs> sorry, as Steph was speaking, I just think of things. Um, oh, such a dream Steph was team. saying about, <laughs> Steph, was saying <laughs> about um, <laughs> Steph was saying about people commenting on, on that humans of COVID post she did. Um, and I'm sure Steph has had comments like this as well, like people just being like, oh, you're so brave or wow, that's amazing. And you're amazing. And, and all these things. And when you first hear them, you're like, okay, guys, calm down. <laughs> like, this is quite easy. I'm just in my bed sharing these things. Like, it's not that amazing. I'm not that brave. But over time, and I think the thing with depression and anxiety disorders is they really get your, they really lower your self-esteem and your self-confidence. And, and, you know, you start to feel really low about, well, obviously you feel low about yourself and, you know, question whether, uh, your value to the world to people mm, and, and worthy. yeah whether you're worthy and I think all of these things really I started I yeah definitely started to get better during during the process of speaking about it on Instagram and and all these amazing people have really helped me to you know they've really boosted my ego which is amazing <laughs> <laughs> and I think self-confidence is something that's kind of like people are like oh she's too confident or you shouldn't be so self-assured and stuff but actually that's just that's just not true like being self-confident is definitely so important to protect your mental health as well so I'm so grateful for all these people like massively like boosting me up and boosting my ego and being like these cheerleaders from all across the world and I don't think people realize how you know social media can be so damaging and those you know comments from I've had a few comments from like trolls and things <laughs> I think someone called me a snowflake or something <laughs> I was like oh okay I mean also the troll comments that are like so far that way I'm like okay whatever um but it just shows like the power of words and like the power of someone just literally typing for two seconds going thank you so much you're great it's like wow you've made my day yeah um, that's so nice I can imagine the person who messaged you that and they're probably like a meme as a profile picture <laughs> so clearly take no notice we're lucky to have such positive Instagrams right Tash I mean mm-hmm. I think like we've both been so lucky and that um most people the majority of things have just been so positive and it's like mm-hmm. it's really lovely and there's also a really weirdly a really nice like medical community kind of on Instagram as well and and um you know we're going through the same thing so we can share it so um you know nothing ever replaces face-to-face contact but I think it's been really amazing especially with the COVID pandemic to have that yeah the COVID pandemic is the big thing and that's really sort of uh sent it to the moon in terms of you know this new way of of interacting with people like I feel like this is the first time we've met virtually but I feel like I know quite a lot about you guys um (laughs) which is just I guess I don't know very millennial in the 21st (laughs) century isn't it gonna slow down with the kids but in terms of what the response you've had and what that does for you guys, you're absolutely right, Tash, with the self-confidence. And we were mentioning perfectionism before as being one of the reasons why maybe medics have mental health issues. But there's also the concept of imposter syndrome. And I think everyone suffers with it to a certain degree, mo- mainly anyway. I had a couple of friends tell me the other day they don't. And I'm like, fair play. You, know, <laughs> you are you know, mentally absolute beasts but absolutely the people coming out and speaking to you and saying these nice things it allows you to realize that that imposter syndrome is probably not as strong as you know or shouldn't be as strong in your mind as it, as it is and that can definitely help mm. to go into opening up about your mental health problems a little bit more rather than on a social media sense what has the response been like in a healthcare setting and at work or at medical school uh, I've had good and bad experiences, um, like I'm sure everybody has. I think, well, the first, I'll start with the not so great things. The first time I went to see my GP about my mental health, I think also it's important to say that every doctor has days where they've worked ridiculous hours. Every doctor has days where they're probably not going to be the best possible doctor. Like that's just 
human <laughs> you can't be at like your top 100% level you know doctors are humans too they're going to say things that perhaps they don't mean they're going to say things that probably if they'd had like eight hours sleep and not been working 12 hours they might not have said but anyway I think sometimes when you say I'm a medical student I don't know whether it's the same as as a doctor I'd hope this is a very rare thing but I was told when the 11th minute of my appointment was um I basically broke down in tears this was the first time I was speaking to a GP about my mental health um I was basically crying kind of refusing to take antidepressants so maybe they were frustrated with me because of that but yeah I was told when the 11th minute of my appointment was which I don't think would have happened had I been like a lay member of society so that was really difficult (laughs) um thankfully the same GP was then actually really good called me like every week to check up on me um and eventually like helped me to um kind of overcome my internal stigma about antidepressants so I had stigma about mental health conditions and I also had stigma about taking medication um my parents had a lot of I love my parents a bit bless them but they're not medical at all but they had a lot of stigma about taking happy pills in inverted commas um for anyone that can't see my air quotes is what they kind of called them um which is not true <laughs> they don't just make you happy so I had to kind of battle with that as well because up until that point I'd already always always listened to sort of what they'd said but I guess in terms of other medical students their response has been amazing um friends are so so supportive and I think like what Steph kind of alluded to earlier is I found it really easy to be open and honest with my friends about my health conditions but if I met someone for the first time and kind of a conversation about mental health came up I'd never be like oh I I've taken antidepressants oh I've had depression and I find myself just dropping it into the conference not like forcefully (laughs) but when the conversation kind of arises I go I just talk about it really casually like I would about a physical health condition like oh I've had um and it feels so what's the word it feels it just feels really good and most of the time no one bats an eyelid about it sometimes people go oh that's amazing that you're so open about that um or that will make you a better doctor whatsoever so or that will make you a better doctor um so yeah overall just being open has helped me so much what more needs to be done to challenge the stigma associated with mental health in the healthcare setting and in your time in medicine what have you noticed in terms of the change in attitude Oh, gosh, a lot. A lot is needed. Um, I, I mean, I think the way that we're talking about, honestly, I just think communication and talking about things more is probably one of the most important things. Getting it out there that having an issue with your mental health is normal and it's okay not to be okay. And like accepting people and realizing that pretty much everyone goes through something at some point in their life is major. Um, I think it's worse within the NHS and with the culture of the NHS, it's worse in some um specialities and others I know that I have a lot of surgical friend, friends who um you know are in surgery and the pressure is really really high there and you know we still have things like 24-hour shifts so there are still shifts where doctors are expected to be on for 24 hours or wait for 24 hours and still doing the same job when as they started by hour 22 which I think is is to, for me, who is like, sleep is the most important thing. I think that's terrible. I, I you know, I, I can't believe that those things still exist. Um, and I think just developing a culture in terms of, you know, people feeling able to seek help is going to be massive. Um, it needs to come from the bosses. It needs to come from high up. But the more we talk about things and, you know, the more people realize that actually if everyone were to be looking after their mental and physical health, work more people would be productive, more work would get done, more, you know, all these things that we're aiming for, the patient care will be better if we put time in to to do all these things. But it's that it's, you know, a whole culture shift, because unfortunately, just a lot of it, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are brilliant doctors or brilliant nurses, brilliant healthcare assistants, whatever their role within the NHS and allied health professionals, but the culture is, the patient is absolutely number one. And we have to do everything in our power to look after that. And just my argument, and I agree, I I agree in terms of, you know, when you're at work, yes, that's your main thing. But if you're not putting yourself first, then you can't look after a patient as well as you could do if you were putting yourself first. If you're not putting yourself first and getting sleep, 
you know, feeling happy, not not feeling sad to be at work. You know, I've had times when I've just dreaded going to work. If I'm a patient, I really prefer to speak to a doctor who is feels safe and happy and supported at work than I would to one who is having a terrible time, wishes they could go home, doesn't want to be here and is feeling like they're trying to hide things because they're ashamed of how they're feeling. So. Mm. Absolutely. You can't pour for an empty glass, can you? I think a big thing for me has been since I got better, I've been much more able to stand up for myself and much more able to put my foot down about things that I think are unreasonable. And previously, before I ever, you know, I wasn't someone who took time off work. That was a weak thing to do. That was not me. I do not take time off work. I do not, you know, I I, I do everything by the book. I do X, Y, and Z. And I used to just think, really badly about those kind of those kind of people I used to have this horrible negative opinion on people who would be trying to look after themselves and you know these days I'm much more able to say hang on I my health is important my health is important so no I think that's unreasonable and and not just taking everything as it as it comes because I think especially as a junior doctor we really do just you feel like you just have to do whatever is told you to do and and have to get on to it and it's not about causing arguments it's just about realizing that you have a voice as well and your voice is also important and that your health is more important than your job I just think is a be all and end all because it took me a really long time to learn that yeah true true health and happiness for sure (laughs) in an ideal world what changes would you both make to medical school and hospital to try and improve this stigma what practical things can we do I would just say, first of all, even get, I guess I'm going to speak more about like the medical school side of things um, because I haven't really experienced, well, I haven't experienced being a doctor before. Um, But I suppose even in terms of getting into medical school, I'd like to see less pressure on being grade eight as a violin or having all these string of co-curricular activities, even if obviously it's important to show that you have things that you can do to switch off. I get that. But even if you just said, I go for a walk (laughs) or like stroke my dog for half an hour, I wish that was more. I mean, I don't know. Things may have changed. I know that when I applied five years ago, um, it was still very much, you know, you have to be really good at something outside of academia. Um, I wish that this decile system, like Steph said, changed. I wish it was easier to stay in the same place as a doctor. So I know that obviously... Well, first of all, you apply to medical school, which could be anywhere in the country that as is so competitive. Then um, you apply to your foundation years, which again could be anywhere in the country. Then you apply to your specialty training years, which could be anywhere in the country. And I think that could really, I know that that's often made me really anxious and made me feel uncomfortable not knowing where I'm going to be. And, you know, even now I'm like, oh, I'm really happy now, but I've got lots of support. I live with my boyfriend. I've got friends nearby. My family aren't that far away. However, moving up to Scotland might set my depression off again. Um, so, yeah, that's something that I, that's kind of a small thing I hope would be able to sort of change. Um, I guess more teaching on how to pre- prevent and how to protect your mental health, because there are so many different like worksheets that I've done through um, counselling and therapy that have really really helped me get on top of my anxiety and as Steph said you know most of the things depression anxiety low mood feelings of anxious are all on a spectrum um so I think these worksheets <laughs> these exercises would help everybody so I'd like to see you know stress management I know I remember the first week of medical school I got told which was great I got told about how to access support when things go wrong which was really great don't go, don't get me wrong but I wish there was something before that step what can we do to that's something that I'd like to see change and yeah just what Steph said I think more acceptance of taking time out um, rather than it being a rush, which I know is difficult in terms of, I guess, taking years out, especially at medical school, it's one more year without an income. <laughs> so it's it can be challenging to, you know, um, take years out. But I think, you know, more acceptable even just to take a week off um, for your mental health. And I guess we have to probably caveat some of the things we're saying here. We're not delusional in the fact that we understand that the NHS is under a tremendous amount of pressure there are long waiting lists and 
there isn't always the capability for us to do whatever we please and take days off willy nilly or, you know, an example of what Tash was saying, not having to move around. That's something that's always terrified me having to move away from where I want to be. But actually, when we sign up to being in medicine, I guess we agree, we sort of um, are agreeing to be on that you know, potential stepping stone to being put somewhere if you don't get the right exam results as much as that will put us under pressure. And I don't know the perfect answer to that. And it's something I guess we need to work out. For me, it's more about the other things that can be done on a smaller scale, which I think were completely, you know, often very, very few and far between. Hopefully are trying to creep in more into hospital life. I don't know if Steph's seen very much. I remember recently having someone come around asking about as a bit of a check-in um, whether or not it was a little bit of a token gesture or not. At least there's something being done there. It can definitely be done on a better scale, but I guess these things um, are starting to become part of the conversation in, in the NHS. What do you guys, Tash first, what do you do to maintain your good mental health at the moment? Oh, so many things. <laughs> um, lots and lots of things. Um, so the first thing I do is I set boundaries of when I'm going to study. I think one thing about being a medical student or I guess a doctor if you're working towards exams is there's always more to learn. Um, and it can be kind of tempting just to keep going and keep going and keep going. It's not really like an essay degree subject where, you know, there is kind of an end point there's only so many words to write there's only so many times you can look at it so I definitely try and treat university a bit like a nine to five um luckily my boyfriend has more of a nine to five job rather than well he has a job rather than as a student so that kind of helps me to stay on track and the other thing I do is I write to-do lists (laughs) like I break down every little thing that I need to do which really helps me to stay on top of things to see where I've got time um, for myself. I also always prioritise making time for myself. I like to like set, make time blocks in my calendar or like my diary or whatever, um, where I won't book anything in, like I won't book a podcast (laughs) recording or, you know, whatever. I just, it's me time. And in that me time, I like to go for walks. Um, I walk with a podcast with my dog. I go for a coffee. Um, I love, especially when it's sunny that just makes me feel so so good I love reading getting engrossed in someone else's life (laughs) and their stresses and worries rather than my own and I love talking to people friends family that always makes me feel better Um, sleep singing in the shower quite badly sometimes all right that makes me feel better I'm sure there's loads more things what else do I do oh I suppose when I get a worry is something that I find really useful I'll sort of briefly talk it through so say I'm this is an example I'm really stressed about my exams I think I'm going to fail so I will go how likely do I think out of 100 that I'm going to fail my exam and at that time it might be I think it's 75 percent likely that I'm going to fail and then on one side of the paper I write down all of the reasons why it's not going to happen so you know I've never failed an exam before I've worked hard for this exam my mum tells me I'm clever, (laughs) things like that. And then on the other side of the paper, I go, oh, what are the reasons why I'm going to fail? And usually I go, oh, um, might be like, oh, I feel a bit nervous about cardiology. But the, the point of it is the reasons why it's going to happen is a very short list compared to why it's not going to happen. So then I go, oh how likely now (laughs) it seems weird talking out then I go oh how likely do I think it's going to come true now and maybe the worry will still be there a little bit but it will definitely be like 40 percent or 50 percent um because sometimes I found that when I said to my mum for example oh I'm really worried about my exam she'd be like oh don't be silly darling you're so brainy you're not gonna fail and sometimes that doesn't help whereas actually being able to like reassure don't get me wrong it's really important to share your worries with other people but sometimes being able to like reassure yourself and to think kind of critically about something (laughs) really helps me (laughs) Um, and kind of see it like as a number thing uh, helps me so that's one thing that I do when things start to go a bit anxious we i think it i think it really helps to objectify something that is often uh, innately quite irrational 
So like you put that, just that example there, it is irrational that you're going to fail your exams because, you know, probability tells you that you've never done that before. And when you put that on paper, it really allows you to separate the feeling that you've got inside because anxiety is horrible. Everyone has those worries and it grips you. And that feeling of dread sometimes at its extreme is is really hard to get your head out of but once it's on paper that's what i've found journaling over the last couple of years like even when it's not anxiety it just allows you to see things slightly differently and weigh weigh things up steph same question what do you do to keep your mental health prosperous yeah of course um so lots of (laughs) prosperous so i was really down in uh start of january actually and i had to do a whole moment of being like okay I want to uh, improve things and I want to get back to where I was and what can I do? Can I make any changes? Um, so, you know, if you're in therapy or checking with therapy, I had a therapy session, which is very useful. It's one thing to mention. Um, I love endorphins. So, um, and I love routine. So getting back into exercise has been massive for me. Like the routine literally gives all that dopamine to my brain. Um, and then the exercise and all the endorphins make me feel great. Definitely prioritizing sleep. Um, and self-care that um, Tash said. And Tash, with you mentioning about the boundaries, I would also say, it's going to sound very antisocial, but also boundaries with people. Um, I love spending time by myself. I um, am, I've turned into that person. I am quite a social person, but I think I'm an introvert at heart. And I've turned into that person who, you know, the memes that are like, oh, someone cancelled their plans and they're sat there like smiling, like, oh yeah, <laughs> night to myself, <laughs> which has definitely become me. Um, I think also what really helps me in kind of, um, so music is massive. Music changes my mood so much. So um, absolutely love listening to music. And instead of books, Tash, I'm a TV person. So uh, getting lost in TV is my uh, go-to. Um, but also things like getting perspective. I think when everything can seem absolutely horrific and like the world is ending, um, you know, after the moment where I've calmed myself down, maybe doing some deep breathing. So I often use the six counts in, hold for four counts, six counts out, hold for four counts, just to slow the body down. I usually found that works really well. And then I just think about perspective and, you know, I kind of think about, and through that, I think of what I'm grateful for. So, you know, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to have people who I love in my life. I'm grateful that the sun shines sometimes and hope hopefully more uh, going into summer. But and and just ha- having that moment of thinking this is not the end of the world, which I'm sure with like exam stress and everything else, that is something we've both we've all experienced is that you literally think it's the end of the world and you're like, whoa, it's an exam. And also you've forgotten about it the next year. And, you, you know, the life, life moves on. Um, so, yeah, they'd be my main things. Yeah, that always helps me to gain perspective by saying to myself, like, am I going to be worried about this in six months time? That really helps. And then also challenging that internal voice in your head that I know for me, I I had and I still have at times like quite a negative image of myself and like not just image, but, you know, I see myself negatively and I get these horrible negative thoughts like, oh, I'm a rubbish daughter, <laughs> I'm a rubbish friend and challenging those and talking. To, it's the cliche saying, but talking to myself like I would talk to my best friend has massively helped me, like hyping myself up. <laughs> definitely yeah. helps me yeah trying to love yourself yeah just being kind like if you you know don't do so well on exam or you don't finish all of your to-do lists not you know massively criticizing yourself being like okay that's fine I'm still gonna you know I'm not just gonna sit here until midnight and still study because I didn't do as well in my exam just yeah being kind yeah not about being perfect the the time um a few weeks ago when I had to switch things up I gave myself a full week to just do whatever the hell I wanted and it was so healing I was like whoa I was like I just you know I went to work obviously did the things I absolutely had to do (laughs) but then the rest of the time I was like I'm going to watch a film and eat popcorn tonight and I'm probably going to do that tomorrow. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, you know, speak to this person or not speak to this person or, you know, just literally just being like, just letting, just letting everything go for a week. And that was massive because um, as you know, you've said, Tash, it's all about kind of realizing your worth and um, trying to start loving yourself and, and allowing yourself to do that means putting yourself first. So if you're putting yourself first, it's like, for me, it shows me that I care about myself and then it makes me feel even better because I'm like, oh, I care about myself being happy these days. Isn't that nice? And, you know, whereas when I let everything go, I, it's very difficult to care about yourself. Hmm. 
I think that theme's come out in a few of the conversations I've had actually in this series and the self-compassion is a massive thing and it's really difficult to practice self-compassion sometimes particularly when you're feeling low or anxious and actually like we're learning with a lot of different things you can sort of hack that so you can hack it like you do with I guess gratitude and things by yeah. practicing being in a mindset of telling you're going to tell yourself you love yourself or you're going to tell yourself that you are good at something and if you do that the amazing thing happens and they've shown it with science that your brain changes your brain is plastic you know you have neuroplasticity and if you keep doing it it does make a difference as much as it might seem a bit silly for the first one two three hundred times if you keep doing it you will notice a difference which i think is just amazing it's so cool our minds are so cool and we have spoken about loads of different stuff today but there's one last question that i like to wrap up with which is is leading on quite nicely from what you guys do to look after yourselves but can you both give me your one best bit of advice for someone to improve their health and happiness i think um my my main thing because there's not just one thing you can do so my main thing would just be like realizing that you're worthy of happiness and deserving of support and you know, like that person who told me that health was more important than my job, just trying your best to accept that. And whoever's listening, you are worthy because you're alive and, you know, you're deserving of support and you're deserving of happiness because that puts you on a level to then go, okay, what can I do about it then? So that would be my thing. Or get an Ollie, which is Cassie's <laughs> job because, I mean, pets are amazing. <laughs> Definitely. I think my thing is to, so Steph and me have just shared what helps our mental health but for somebody listening you might think oh that sounds horrific that's going to make me more stressed that's going to make me more sad so I think investing time in yourself to find what makes you happy and find what you can do to make yourself happy is the best thing that I ever did so for example I found that doing a thousand piece jigsaw puzzles which sounds really lame um, and it is very lame um, was massively helpful for my anxiety because or just even before having anxious thoughts because it was so for example loads of people talk about mindfulness right and I never really got on with the apps or kind of guided meditation or or anything like that but I interpret mindfulness as anything that allows me to switch off my thoughts and to kind of focus on one thing and I found that watching tv I would still like be on my phone um I would you know or even going for a walk I could still scroll on Instagram and all of these things and I still had loads of other thoughts whereas doing something like a jigsaw puzzle which takes me hours and hours I'm really not very good at it I literally had to focus so hard on this one thing which where I didn't have any other thoughts it's like cooking as well for me because I'm not a very good cook so I have to focus so hard but yeah, I think just my one piece of advice is to invest the time in yourself. And it can be hard, like life is busy, What you know, if you're working, if you're studying, whatever. But I think like we've said quite a lot in this podcast already, just taking that time out. Um, and I guess, you know, taking a week off can feel like, oh, it's the end of the world. It's a week. But in the long run, that's going to save you so much time. Um, yeah. Invest time in yourself. <laughs> I completely second that, Tash. I completely second that because, uh, you know, when I'm when we're doing all our spiels of what helps, it's really about finding what helps um, just exactly as you said. So, yeah, 100 percent. It's very easy to be drawn into like this self-care. I'm doing air quotes like Tash, but <laughs> self-care or wellness. And I guess we're all culprits of it on our social respective social medias of being like, oh, do this to improve this or, or, you know, giving people suggestions is what is what we're doing. But you're absolutely right. It's got to be something you find beneficial because I know tons of people that actually find mindfulness like the worst thing in the world. It just makes it like their anxieties, you know, enhance and um, they can't do it at all. So it's finding that time, taking that time to find what it is for you guys. Um, and like you doing the jigsaw puzzles, I did one recently and I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. I forgot how good it was. And I think <laughs> what you do is you get into that, you get into that flow state. Um, they're very therapeutic jigsaw puzzles, but you get into that flow state, don't you? And I think I personally have, have missed that flow state quite a lot in my mm. recent years just because you're so busy doing other stuff when as a kid you were just constantly doing it you're constantly achieving that flow state you weren't thinking about things especially in your teenage and and, ch and sort of child years yeah 
Another thing for that, guys, is the paint by numbers. Sorry, yeah, just adult paint, paint, paint by numbers. Yeah, been there, done I that once. stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, six hours, six yeah. hours. I looked up at the clock and I was like, oh. Yeah, adult paint by numbers. That's really good. <laughs> I second that. That was my second one after Jigsaws. And nobody talks about that on social media. No. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> New post coming soon. <laughs> Maybe with reason. <laughs> Joy post. <laughs> there you go, Steph. There's an idea. <laughs> oh, God, don't. <laughs> I think we should make Jigsaw's cool again, to be honest. Um, yeah. Guys, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting to me. It's honestly been a, a really lovely conversation. I feel like I've learned a lot about you both and, and things that I think are really useful and that people will resonate with. Um, so yeah, thanks for taking the time to open up and, and have a chat with me today. Oh, thanks for inviting us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was so lovely. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Straight Talking Doctor Pod. I hope you not only found this episode interesting, but also hopefully learned something that you can use to help improve your life. If you enjoyed the podcast, or even if you didn't, I'd be so, so grateful if you could go onto your streaming site and leave a five-star review so that I can reach as many people as possible. Finally, if you have any feedback or suggestions for further guests, please get in touch with me at The Straight Talking Doctor on Instagram. 